7. Hideki Tojo Remains According to documents released from the US, the remains of Japan's former World War II Prime Minister, Hideki Tojo, were spread throughout the Pacific Ocean after his execution. Officials were worried followers of Hideki Tojo, one of the main individuals responsible for the Japanese assault on Pearl Harbor in 1941, were trying to recover his remains and glorify him as a martyr after all he'd done. Tojo and six others were burned after being executed for their heinous war crimes in 1948. The ashes were then dumped into the water by U.S. Army aircraft. Hiroyuki Takazawa, a Japanese lecturer at Tokyo's Nihon University, found the declassified records in the U.S. National Archives in Washington, D.C. I certify that I received the remains, supervised cremation, and personally spread the ashes of the following executed war criminals at sea from an 8th Army liaison plane, wrote a member of the U.S. Army named Marge Luther Frierson in one document dated December 23, 1948. This was the day Tojo and the others were condemned. Frierson wrote that he watched their execution and then boarded an aircraft carrying their ashes, which were placed in separate urns. Despite the fact that there were no bodies to bury, the executed man are now memorialized at Japan's notorious Yasukuni Shrine. The Shinto Shrine is dedicated to the lives of about 2.5 million Japanese men, women, and children who have died for their country since its establishment back in 1869. Tojo and the other six were among 14 convicted Class A war criminals that are now part of the shrine. 6. Operation Paperclip As World War II came to a close, American and British agencies worked together to explore occupied Germany for whatever military, scientific, or technical development research they could get their hands on. As Allied forces seized German research institutions, organizations like the Combined Intelligence Objective Subcommittee CIOS, began collecting war-related records, resources, and scientists. The Ossenberg List, discovered in a toilet at Bonn University, was a list full of scientists and engineers that were forced to work for the Third Reich. During the Cold War, about 1,600 of these German scientists and their families were transferred to the United States in a secret mission, initially called Operation Overcast, but later renamed to Operation Paperclip. The program was run by the newly formed Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency JIOA. The goal was to harness German intellectual resources and intelligence to aid the development of U.S. rockets, as well as biological and chemical weapons, while also ensuring such vital information did not end up in the hands of the Soviet Union. Despite his formal approval, President Harry Truman barred the CIA from enlisting any Nazi members or active Nazi supporters in this group. Nevertheless, officials at the JIOA and the Office of Strategic Services OSS, ignored this order by removing signs and evidence of war crimes from the chosen scientists' records, believing their information was critical to the country's post-war attempts despite the past. Werner von Braun was one of the most well-known recruits of the bunch. He was the project leader of the Pinamunde Army Research Center in Germany, who was key in designing the fatal V-2 rocket that spread devastation across England during the war. He and a handful of other rocket scientists traveled to Fort Bliss, Texas and White Sands Proving Ground NM under the disguise of War Department Special Employees to help with U.S. Army rocket testing. Von Braun later went on to become the director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and was the principal designer of the Saturn V launch vehicle, which took 24 astronauts to the moon. Although supporters of this covert operation say that if these Nazi scientists had not been brought over to the United States, the balance of power could have easily swayed towards the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The other side points to the moral cost of ignoring their war crimes without consequences or responsibility. 5. Hitler's Presence in Colombia The US looked into allegations that Adolf Hitler had managed to survive after World War II and lived in Colombia during the 1950s. Documents pertaining to this inquiry have been available for years, but have recently resurfaced in the context of about 2,800 classified documents related to the killing of former American President John F. Kennedy. Based on these leaked documents, CIA operatives learned from a former SS officer that Adolf Hitler might have lived in Colombia in the 1950s in a commune built of ex-Nazis. After originally dismissing this intelligence, the agents eventually filed a report to their superiors referencing a photograph. Former SS officer Philip Citroen called the CIA and notified them of his meeting with a man claiming to be the former Nazi ruler. 
By the time the agents decided to investigate, the suspect Adolf Schuttelmeyer had escaped to Argentina. But the CIA was doubtful of the source material and decided to discontinue its investigation. The former SS officer stated in CIA documents that the individual he met looked very much like Adolf Hitler and claimed to be him. Citroen stated that he met Hitler in Residencies Coloniales in Tunia, Colombia, which he characterized as being full of German Nazis. The CIA dismissed this alleged proof, but in 1955, a second individual, codenamed Similodi III, gave authorities the same story, stating that on repeated trips to Colombia, Citroen met with the man suspected of being Hitler once a month. This also provided the agents with an image of Citroen and the supposed dictator, who was identified on the reverse end as Adolf Schuttelmeyer. According to Similodi III, Hitler left Colombia in January 1955 and relocated to Argentina. Based on Similodi's new information, the CIA prepared a statement and sent it to their supervisors, but they proposed abandoning the prospective probe, since they couldn't confirm what the two had claimed and the financial investment would have been too enormous to act on without concrete proof. 4. Project Zebra Almost 75 years ago, an airplane on a secret mission for Russia crashed into the Pasco Tank River in Elizabeth City. It was kept hidden there for decades. The mission was part of Project Zebra, a collaboration effort between President Franklin D. Roosevelt and Soviet Union Premier Joseph Stalin. The United States agreed to provide the Soviet Union with a modified version of the PBY Catalina, an aircraft that could attack submarines. The PBM-1 Nomad, a Russian variant of the plane, had an increased fuel reserve and a greater range. According to M. G. Kriske's novel, the Navy built 185 of these huge aircraft at a shipyard in Philadelphia. Over the course of 18 months in 1944 and 1945, over 300 Soviet pilots were trained at the Elizabeth City Coast Guard facility. According to Don Pendergraft, director of the Museum of the Albemarle in Elizabeth City, this partnership was one of the last of its kind between the countries. Marjorie Berry, a local historian who's examined the events, says that Russian aviators frequently came into town and purchased a large quantity of clothing, cigarettes, and French perfume from the local pharmacy shop. They would put it on the Russian black market, where items like this were virtually impossible to come by. Berry remembers her father's memories of watching aviators who couldn't speak English shopping in downtown businesses. He had no idea what the Russians were doing there, but he noticed how kind they were. The late Greg Gagarin, a translator and avionics specialist, contributed copies of mission documentation and images to the city's museum 10 years ago. Gagarin was critical to Project Zebra's overall success. In 1943, he graduated from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with a degree in electrical engineering and decided to join the Navy. He was told to go to a Pacific-based seaplane unit and was sent to the Naval Air Station at Norfolk. Nothing further about the covert operation was revealed to him. Gagarin then wandered about the base for three days before determining what he had to do next. The incident happened at the end of the program. On January 11, 1945, a nomad filled with American products took off over the Pascatank River in the dark. It was flown by a Royal Canadian Air Force soldier and carried eight other aviators inside. Soon after departing, a section of the plane collided with the water and plummeted straight into the Pascatank River, killing five individuals on board. The pilot and the three others were left unharmed. The pilot later admitted that he lost his bearings after following safety lights on the ground and switching to instrumentation for night flight. The Museum of the Albemarle remembered those who died in this disaster on January 11th in Elizabeth City. The Russian ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Antonov, as well as Russian students and elected leaders attended the remembrance. Locals were supposed to act out a reenactment and pay their respects. 3. The Manhattan Project The Manhattan Initiative was a U.S. government research project that developed the first atomic weapons for a few years, mainly from 1942 to 1945. American scientists, most of whom had escaped their fascist governments in Europe, were told of breakthroughs in nuclear fission in 1939 and worried that Nazi Germany might produce a nuclear weapon themselves. In the same year, scientists in the States encouraged President Franklin D. Roosevelt to launch a program to explore the possible military applications fission could be used for, and $6,000 was authorized. In response, the Uranium Advisory Committee was formed. 
The project can be traced back to December 6, 1941, with the establishment of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, led by Vannevar Bush. The project was codenamed Manhattan in 1942, after the location of Columbia University, where much of the research was conducted during its early stages. Both the University of California and the University of Chicago, where physicist Enrico Fermi created the first nuclear reactor in 1942, conducted the research. In 1943, scientists led by J. Robert Oppenheimer constructed a laboratory in Los Alamos, New Mexico to build the infamous bomb. Scientists from the Manhattan Project detonated the first atomic bomb in a test at Alamogordo, New Mexico. The project had cost $2 billion and employed 125,000 people by the time of its completion. 2. Project Habakkuk during World War II, the British devised Project Habakkuk, whose goal was to build an aircraft carrier out of pikrete, a combination of wood pulp and ice, to combat the German U-boat threat in the mid-Atlantic. Jeffrey Pike, who worked at Combined Operations Headquarters, came up with the initial idea. The project was cancelled, though, after scale tests and the construction of a design on Patricia Lake in Jasper National Park in Alberta, Canada, failed due to rising costs, new demands, and the availability of longer-range aircraft and escort carriers, which closed the mid-Atlantic gap and need for the project. Meanwhile, in the United States, the manufacturing of M29 weasels for Project Plow, a program thought up to construct an elite force for winter operations in Norway, Romania, and the Italian Alps. Pike developed the concept for Habakkuk. He had been thinking about how to safeguard seaborne landings and Atlantic convoys from aviation strikes. Steel and aluminium were in low supply since they were needed for more pressing uses. Pike determined the solution was simply ice, which could be produced for 1% of the energy required to produce an equivalent amount of steel. He recommended that a natural or man-made iceberg be leveled to create a runway and carved out to store planes. This wasn't the first time the proposal was introduced either. In 1940, an idea for an ice island was passed through higher-ups, but was seen as a joke by most personnel, notably Neville Shute, who openly criticized the plan. The document was retrieved just as it was about to reach the first Sea Lord's mailbox. In official papers, the project's codename was frequently misspelled as Habakkuk. This might have been due to Pike's mistake. In one unsigned document, it is spelled H-A-B-B-A-K-U-K. Post-war publications by those involved in the project such as Peretz and Goodeve used the correct spelling, with one B and three Ks. The name references the project's lofty goal. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. Habakkuk 1.5 1. Operation Overlord In 1944, a campaign was developed for the invasion of continental Europe during World War II and was given the name Operation Overlord, which was also used to refer to the Battle of Normandy. The most crucial part of the project was to get the Allied troops inside Europe. They were aware the plan would fail and that there would be heavy casualties, but they went ahead with the plan and, miraculously, it was a success. The United States, United Kingdom, and Canada provided the majority of forces. Australia, Belgium, the Czech Republic, France, Greece, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, and Poland were also among the other countries that sent troops. The preparations were extensive and complicated, and Overlord was among the biggest and bloodiest amphibious assaults in military history. Almost three million men crossed the English Channel from England to Normandy, which, at the time, was heavily occupied by the Germans. The first 40 days were spent capturing Cannes and Cherbourg, especially Cherbourg, for its well-positioned deep-water port. Brittany, a region in France, and its Atlantic ports would then be targeted. The northern French railways and highways would be bombarded to prevent reinforcements from arriving, and the Allies would then go 125 miles southwest of Paris. The Allies dominated the territory between Loire in the south and the Seine in the northeast. Meanwhile, the Allies worked hard to convince Germans the invasion would take place somewhere else. The Allies practiced military deception in the months leading up to the invasion. In 1944, Germany's coastline defenses were relatively low. After Normandy was chosen as the invasion site, it was decided to try and fool the Germans into thinking it was a fake invasion and that the real one would happen somewhere else. This was known as Operation Bodyguard. In the weeks leading up to the operation, the Allies tried to persuade the Germans that a major invasion would take place at the Pas de Calais and Norway. 
Deception was a business in and of itself. It included fake communications, dummy tanks near Dover and the south coast of England, the use of double agents to spread false information. The deception was a huge success. It caused Hitler to postpone reinforcements from the Pas de Calais region for weeks. The original plan specified 14 days. In his memoirs, General Omar Bradley termed bodyguard the single worst farce of the war. The Battle of Normandy continued until August 30, 1944, when German forces fled over the Seine. This was the end of Operation Overlord and a major turning point in the war. Thanks for watching. Have you heard of any other declassified documents that should be in a video like this? Tell us in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.